All right, welcome back. Shh. Very good, very good. I uh, hope everyone's well. A brief announcement. I sent you an email a few minutes ago. Uh, no class on the 13th. Uh, so, so I know you're... Do you, do you know I once got a complaint on my evaluation that I cancel class too much? <laughs> I, and I, I, no, no, and they were actually convinced that I was cheating them. I'm, I'm not joking. My evals last semester, one of my sections complained that I canceled classes. You guys have your upsides. I'll give you that. Um, so. <laughs> On the 13th, if you just, I update the syllabus, there's no class. Uh, this won't really affect our semester. I had put a makeup day at the end, which now we'll end up using. So we'll have a, uh, the, actually two makeup days. So we'll have a class on the 16th. And as it stands now, a final exam review session on the 23rd. I can move that up to the 21st if nothing else happens, but I'll just leave that empty day there in case something else happens. Sometimes we have flooding. That happens more in the fall than the spring. And last, Last year we had a, a, a class cancel for rain, and that was one of the cancel classes. And there were two Jewish holidays I canceled class, and they were just they were all upset. So I, I can't I can't help them. Uh, the twenty seventh is still off too, right? Because like, I looked it down. Like, we we don't have class on twenty seventh. That that's not our class in general. I think the semester ends. Uh, no 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 February twenty seventh. February twenty seventh. Uh, so I, I think yeah, that's still on the twenty seventh. I'm not here that day. Yep. Okay, okay. So if you guys want to complain about Miss Class. No, 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 no. I, I've never had that in all my years of teaching. I was like, what? And like three or four people put that on their evaluation. So it must be something they were really worried about. No, and they never once said anything to me about it. Country, I would have gladly made them. <laughs> look, I've had weekend makeup sessions. And do you know how people come to that? Basically no one, right? I've tried getting people to come at weekends. I've tried classes like at 7.30 p.m. Like I've tried that, just no one shows up. So I basically say, we'll just make up the end of the semester. No, they were day students. Whatever. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Just one note. OK, so you know we do the evals on paper. We're actually switching. I don't know if it's this semester or maybe next semester. But we're switching to online. So there, there are pros and cons. And we, we were talking about this. So one of the pros is the paper forms are actually not very good. And people don't always fill in their bubbles all the way because they're kind of lazy. It's not like an exam where you care. So if you have these like incomplete bubbles, and you, the, the machine doesn't actually read them. So you have a lot of like basically what we call an under ballot in voting, right? Where there's people don't fill in certain bubbles. Also, uh, people don't like writing by hand, so people don't actually put comments in. So the online, also if you're absent on a given day, you have no way of putting the evaluations because it's done on paper. So the online versions will be done in class on your laptop or on your smartphone, which means you can type, which I think there's pros and cons because people want to type good stuff and they'll want a verbal diary of bad stuff. So I think the comments will get a lot more uh, 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 negative comments will get a lot more serious. The positive comments will be okay. So I think the, I'll, on the second for question. So I think the, the typing will be one thing to worry about. Um, also, you can film out outside of class. So if you're absent, you can do it at home. So you don't maybe have to take 10 minutes of class time to do it, which I think is always a plus. I get 10 minutes for my lecture back, and I don't have to like artificially finish. Like, all right, let's do your evaluations now. Um, the one thing I'm not worried about, but I'm just aware of, is people are going to start screenshotting their evals. Right? If it's on your phone, they'll just like, tweet them. And you know, I, don't, I actually make mine public. I, I, actually, I don't care about that. Uh, so it's, not, it's not a secret in my mind. But some, for some people who are not tenured, it's actually very dangerous for those to get out because they're not always. Evaluations are not very accurate. I've taught the same class twice in the same semester, and the evals completely in different directions. The same lecture, the same person teaching the same exact material, and it's like night and day, <laughs> literally. Right? You just have completely different marks as a professor and it's just confounding right I had the same office hours last semester I was on the campus same number of hours one class said he was really available the other one said he was not available right so it's like it, it, it's torturous so these evals can be very misleading so I worry about them getting out but I, I don't care I make my public it doesn't matter to me but that's one change the other change which we're going to move to instead of one to five one to seven and I don't fully understand the rationale why, um, but apparently when there's only one to five, people just cluster around threes or fours, or maybe fives. One to seven gives you more options, like a gradation. Well, he's not great, he's not good, but maybe somewhere between. So you could stretch out a little bit more. There, there's signs on this, I can't explain it to you, I don't really know. By the way, it, it doesn't matter what I, well, I shouldn't say that, but the changes are, are going in that direction. So I don't know if it'll be this year or next year, but 
Uh, they'll definitely be online. The one to seven thing is probably, I don't know when that will be, but we're still talking about it, but that's probably going to happen also. OK, I saw people with their hands. Anyone want to comment on this? I, I always like to tell you what I, what's going on in the school, because you don't usually find out otherwise. And this is like your, yes? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you got a survey, right? A survey in the mail? OK, so these classrooms suck. Right, I, I don't, I don't, I don't need to tell you that the, the seats, the seats are very uncomfortable. Like we have to sit in those seats. We have faculty meetings. We had four hours of faculty meetings last week. I was sitting right around where Celeste is sitting. They usually might sit right in the back, um, uh, and the seats suck. Right, the outlets are not comfortable places. Uh, these these rooms were built before computers were a thing. Right, the desks are fairly thin, and if you have a bigger laptop, actually, when you have, you know, those big gamer laptops, right, it doesn't even fit. On the you know on the desk right because it wasn't built for it so you kind of like have to like crunch in here. Um, also, as you probably know, this this room's a hazard. Look how many steps I have right by the thing. I've tripped. I think you've seen me. I've tripped a couple times. It's dangerous. And and, and don't get me started on, on this right. <laughs> it, it's I mean I'm not the tallest faculty member, but I have to hit my head every time I walk under that thing. And like here you have to go a step here and. I, these classrooms are very poorly laid out. They're very close together. They were built for a different time where no one had a computer. Uh, so we're thinking about how to maybe renovate the classrooms. That's not immediate. This is probably will take effect after you graduate, right? So I, I, things move slowly, right? Surveys are the first step to see what's important. But, but take the thing seriously, right? Fill out, you know, put your preferences. Just take five minutes and do it. It's not, I actually did mine yesterday. I, we got the same survey you guys did. And, and see what you think. Uh, but like these steps are just really dangerous. Uh, and, and for people with you know, disabilities, this is just not a good classroom. Uh, these little monitors on the side are not good substitutes because you can't see them as well. That's like, you know, they're, they're pretty small. Uh, you know, this thing, you know, this, yeah, it's just, it's not a good setup. Uh, anyway, so I don't expect this to happen anytime soon, but think of your comments and, and you know, think about it. This room isn't bad because you only have about 40 of you. In my morning class, I have like 85 students. So basically, in the same room, I think almost every seat is full. Right? So if you want to space out, you know, empty seat here, empty seat there, you can. But in my, my day students, this is about ni maybe 95 or 100. So almost every seat is full in every row, uh, which it, it, gets, it gets close. So you're, you're, you're elbowing with your you're <coughs> typing when you're writing by hand. If you're lefty or righty. Um, the, the better shape, so these are kind of rectangles like this. The better one is longer. Right, so it goes further out, so I don't have as much on the side because when I'm looking straight, I can't see you three, and I can't see all of you. I have to physically turn my body. Right, I actually think about these things. I have to. That's why I pace back and forth to give eye contact to the entire uh, room. But if if it's a long room, I hit all of you at once. I don't have to do this artificial pacing. Um, but I do like this where I can walk around. That that is helpful. I do like that. Um, with this step, really bad. Anyone any comments on that? I can relay it to the extent I have any input, which I. It's terrible. It's always too hot or too, too cold? Yeah, I get that a lot. It takes a lot of time to adjust. So Houston is somewhat. Um, the temperature swings a lot. It can go 40 degrees in one day. Right, it'll be in the 50s in the morning. It can be in the 80s in the afternoon. So it does not adjust well. But I, 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 I understand the that kind. I, I, you're not getting arguing with me. I, it's an old building. And I see this one, I can kind of clear if I duck. Rocky's taller than me. Rocky's a few inches. I think he's the tallest guy in the building. Maybe, maybe Treese is a little taller, but yeah, but like I, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's real close. And Rocky's taller than me. Anyone else in comments? Oh, I'm not going to answer that. What are you with all these questions? No, stop. No, we don't do that. It's short. It's my God. It's fraught with you. <laughs> That's terrible. OK. Um, any other questions before we start class? All right. All right. OK, so let's, um, let's do a question to start. And this will segue from our last uh, semester, or last class, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're not complaining about canceled. I was shocked. Who the hell complains about canceled classes? I, 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 you know, every semester I learn something new from students. I never expected the things, the things students pick up on. It's never things I think they're going to pick up. I, I worry about things, and they come up with left field. So, all right, whatever. All right, uh, question: Who is the mortgagor? The buyer, 
or the lenser. This one should be straightforward. Uh, we'll see if it is. Another uh, 10, 15 seconds. Okay. All righty. <coughs> oh, and also make sure you put your attendance in as well. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'll stop it there. All right, let's see what we got. Wow, good job, guys. Good job. Very good. All right, the, the answer is A by overwhelming majority. Um, the mortgagor is the buyer, right? The mortgagor is the one who gives the mortgage. The mortgagee is the lender. It's the one who receives the interest, okay? Now, that was a topic that's useful for last class, but it's also a topic that's useful for this class. And let me explain the transition, right? If you want to buy a property, you want to buy Blackacre, right? One thing you might want to know is, is there a mortgage on the property, right? Because if you buy a property with a mortgage on it, it's not guaranteed that the seller pays off the mortgage, right? Uh, Usually that happens. Right? I'm sure you've all bought houses and they've all had mortgages. Maybe most of you have, but many of you bought houses and there's a mortgage on it and the guy moving out paid off his mortgage and you never had to deal with it. But it's entirely possible to have a crook, right? I own Blackacre. I say, hey, I'm going to sell you Blackacre and I don't tell you about the mortgage. And you come in, guess what? You own Blackacre. That's now an interest on your property. You are subject now to that interest and you might go to foreclosure, right? So how do you prevent the risk of buying a house with a mortgage attached to it, right? How do you avoid entering into a disaster? And the answer is recording systems, right? The answer is a recording system. The reason why recording systems exist is to put the public on notice about what interests may exist in a given piece of property. Now, when I say interest, what I'm talking about is maybe there's a mortgage, right? Uh, maybe someone has a future interest, right? Maybe there's some sort of a, a, a shifting interest, right? You remember those from last semester, right? Maybe there's some sort of a foreclosure notice, right? These are various things that make a property uh, not so valuable, right? You don't want to walk into a house and have to deal with the mortgage that's sitting over from the prior owner. Okay. Also, recording systems provide a very basic information. Does the person selling Blackacre actually own Blackacre and Fee Simple? Right? It sounds like an obvious question, but again, people are crooks, especially in this class. Right? In this class, you're going to have people who steal, lie, and cheat. And they'll say, oh, yeah, I own Blackacre and Fee Simple. No problem, they don't. Right? In fact, I can almost guarantee you on my exam, some guy will say, yep, yeah, NFP simply is lying. Right? I, can, I, can, I can almost, I haven't written it yet, but I can almost promise you that'll be one of the questions I give you guys. Okay? So one of the basic goals of a recording system is to determine, does the seller actually have fee simple? Right? All right, this creates certainty, right, in the marketplace. This makes property easier to alienate, that is easier to sell. Right? It also creates a safe place to store documents. Right? There's a central repository in, say, this county, and everyone knows in Harris County, here's a place you go to find your records. There's, not, there's, no, there's no disputes. Right? And you're basing on actual evidence. It's not based on my say-so. It's not that, oh yeah, I've lived on Blackacre for 20 years, it's mine. That may not be enough. Okay, so recording systems are designed to uh, remove doubt, uh, remove confusion over what Black Acre is, who owns Black Acre, what the interests are. Okay? You with me? Okay. Now, I need to make a very simple point at the beginning, which you're going to lose, but I want to keep coming back to it. Recording is not required to make a transaction valid, right? You do not need to record to make a transaction valid. <coughs> okay? I can sell you Blackacre, and if neither of us record, that's fine, right? Between you and me, I sold you Blackacre, and we're cool, right? Recording systems only matter when a third party comes into the picture, right? If a third party comes in. So I sell you Blackacre, and you sell her Blackacre. Aha! Once you sell to a third party, 
the failure of the two of us to record matters because the third party will have no knowledge of this prior transaction, right? The third party will not know. So always, as between the buyer and the seller, you don't need to record and the transaction is perfectly valid. But the failure to record matters once a third party comes into the picture. You'll see this a lot in the, in the, um, uh, the Mother Hubbard case, Luthie versus Evans, that it really mattered about the recording issue. Okay? Same with a mortgage, right? If I make a mortgage with a bank and I agree to this mortgage and neither of us record, it's fine, right? I have to pay off my note, there's no doubt. But if I don't record and the bank fails to record, then a subsequent buyer will not be on notice that this mortgage is in place, right? So the failure to record only bites you in the butt when a third party comes in. But of course, a third party always comes in, Josh, right? Isn't that obvious? There's always someone else down the road, right? You, property doesn't stop with B. It always goes to C, D, and E. So practically speaking, the failure to record will screw you eventually, not right away, but it will cause problems somewhere down the road. But all you have to remember for now is initially between A and B, there's no problem. The transaction's valid, right? At least five of you on your exam will write, well, A and B sold it to each other, A sold to B, they didn't record, the transaction's void. No, 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 no. You'll do it, I'm telling you not to, right? Between A and B, the transaction's valid. But it might not be valid as to C. Okay, you're with me? Okay, thank you. All right. I'm sorry? Between A and B, it's not required. But if you're A and you said, I'd like to record. Well, either can do it or both can do it. Now, let me just make this point clear. If one party records and not the other one records, it makes challenges, right? Because you may not know what name to search for. So let's just, I want to answer Angie's question briefly, right? Let's say that the seller records, but the buyer doesn't. And you're the third party, Angie, you come along. You may not know the seller's name to search for him. So if only one party records, it may not be enough to put you on notice. See, that, that's where it comes in. That's why if you're the receiving end, you're the buyer, you should record to make the chain complete so people know who to search for. Or I'll give you another example. What happens if they record slightly different copies, right? Before there were, before there were copy machines, right? Now everyone Xeroxes in five seconds. But let's say that you're back in the day with no copy machines. You had someone handwrite a deed, two copies, right? That, that's fine. What if on one deed they made a mistake, they wrote February 28th, the other deed they wrote February 29th, they just made a typo. And then may, they may not match up. Or let's say you spell Elliot on one deed with two T's, you spell Elliot on the other deed with one T. They may not match up. So even if both record, you still may have problems. So this is not a panacea, right? So recording is optional, I think that's a correct statement. But even if both parties record, you still have issues. It's, uh, yes, Corbett. Um, well, uh, property taxes, if neither party registers with the county, uh, that the, my guess is they send a bill to the house and the house doesn't get paid, they put a, they put a lien on the house, whoever lives there. They'll figure it out. They investigate, they can figure it out. Right, in other words, if there's a house that exists and they're not paying property taxes, they'll figure out who lives there. They may call utility company. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll figure it out. I mean, there, there are ways to find out who lives in a house. Right, I mean, when I, when I moved into my house about a year ago, we changed all the names very quickly, but you can imagine people aren't so uh, punctual, right? They'll figure it out. Yes, yes, Mike. How common is that, though, as far as you buy a house, but doesn't, don't, doesn't the title company? Well, of course, Mike, of course. Title companies do all this stuff for you. You don't have to worry about it. But in our world, people don't use title companies, right? It, oh. It, oh. In this class, we don't have that luxury, right? If you read in your exam, no, stupid, there's a title search. That's, that's probably not the right answer, right? That's, that, that's, uh, that's probably not the right answer I'm looking for, right? I need you to suffer, and let's suffer. So let's actually walk through um, the two different kinds of indexes, okay? All right, uh, where did I leave off last time? Avery, you're next? Thank you, patiently waiting. Okay, is Michael next after you? Okay, Avery. Avery, tell me please, what is a tract index? A tract, T-R-A-C-T, a tract um, it's index. It's like a, a tract of land, so it's kind of like a grid. 
Very good. Remember like Battleship board game when you were a kid, like B or like Bingo, right? You have a number, you have a letter, right? So imagine just dividing the entire city into Houston into a series of grids. So, you know, a spot like X25, right? And you know exactly where that lot is. It would be very easy if a city was divided into a perfect grid. Most cities are not divided into a perfect grid. Why? They were built incrementally. Right? Most cities weren't built as, as century planned locations. Like DC, for example, the District of Columbia was built as a central planning. Pierre L'Enfant was this French architect. But most cities are not. So the track indexes where every plot of land has a number, they don't exist in most cities. We don't have that in Houston. I don't think anywhere in Texas has it. I don't know places that do have it. I think they're, they're, they're very rare. right? But this is what the, I, by the way, these projectors suck, another comment. Um, that, uh, by the way, that camera there does not live stream. That's why I have this, because it actually live streams. That camera just records to a central server somewhere that I can't get to. So that's why I bring my own camera. Oh, I'm getting a new one next week. It's much smaller. So hopefully it should work much better. It's like, it's, like a, it's like a fraction the size. All right, so this is what the track index looks like. Okay, so that's the first kind. Michael, you want to tell me about the, te the second type of index we have is called? Okay, very good. So just, Michael, refresh your recollection. What's a grantor and what is a grantee? Grantor is the one who's giving the title and the grantee is the one who's receiving it. Very good. The grantor is the person giving the title, that is the seller. And the grantee is the person receiving the title, that is the buyer. Right? The grantor grantee index lists who is the seller and who is the buyer and what do they sell. Uh, this picture is a little bit hard for you to see, I'm, sh I'm sure. But if you look on your computers, you can probably see more close. We have one column that says grantee. You have one column that says grantor. You have another column that says kind of deed. Another column says date of deed. So for example, this one says fee simple, right? You can indicate who sold what to whom and when. And this is the, the index of deeds. The purpose of this is to allow you to search line by line year by year to see who sold what and when. Okay? All right. So go to your books on page 664, please. This is going to take a while, but we're, we're, we're going to suffer through it. 664. All right. This will show you how to do a title search. Has anyone ever done this before, by the way? <coughs> you have one? Um, just on different properties. Really? You did it by yourself? That's cool. How, you did as well? Yeah, I've been doing it for the last few tenants. Are you a para? Uh, it's for the basement. Oh, OK. And, and you've done this just for your own? Yeah. Right. Well, if any of you want to do this, <laughs> you, can, you can do it on your own. Uh, I, I, you can. It's, a good, it's maybe a good, good, good field trip, I guess, to the, to the records office. Um, some of these records will be like, you've done it, Lisa? Oh, <laughs> you hire people. Right. Well, I've had students who do it before. I've had people who are landmen who do oil and gas, and this is something they do all the time. Right. Now, a lot of the records that are recent will be electronic, which is probably a lot easier. But when you get to a certain point, they're not electronic. They're in big, dusty, smelly books that are you know, maybe half a century old. And you can't use an excuse. Well, I don't want to look at the paper. You have to go back. How far back do you have to go? We might say go back 50 years. No, no, not enough. 100 years, probably not enough. You might have to go back to, well, maybe not the Mayflower, but at least back to the Texas Independence, early 1800s. Back to you know, the Louisiana Purchase, right? You saw that reading, right? Uh, you have to go back far, and then why? Because if there's some distant cousin somewhere in the world who has a superior claim, you've just made a purchase that's not worth anything, right? So you actually have to do your homework. Now, Mike asked, well, what about title insurance? That's what they do. The title insurance people, people Lisa hires to do the grunt work, right? They actually do the digging. And they'll go through these musty old books to figure out who owns what. That's what you pay them for. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of time. They're pretty good at doing it quickly, but it takes you know, some skill. So let's walk through this chart. So it begins on page 664. All right. Uh, one note that's important to remember, I'll tell you this very clearly. You always start with the grantee index. People get this wrong in the exam every year. You always start with the grantee index. Okay, now why? Allah, 
why do you start with the grantee index rather than the grantor index? As a practical matter, why do you have to start with the grantee index? Be the most, like, recent. Well, what are you searching for? What name are you searching for usually when you're the buyer? The seller. Okay. Where will the seller's name appear most recently? The why? Yes, bingo, that's exactly right. When you buy a property, the only name you know is your seller. You don't know where you got it from, but you know your seller. But what you want to find out is, when was your seller a buyer, right? How did your seller get it? He was a buyer. Therefore, you search for your guy's name, your seller's name, the grantee index. And that will help you learn who he got it from. This was Angie's question a minute ago. You don't know who the previous seller was. You don't know the person's name. So unless you learn from the recorded deed of your buyer, you have nowhere to start. So you always start the grantee index to find out who'd your buyer get it from. I'm sorry, who'd your seller get it from? All right, so this is gonna be an example. And by the way, the names are like A, B, C, D, right? Cotter, Dubeck, et cetera, right? It's always alphabetical order. I try to do that in my exam, not always, but it helps. Okay, so we say, assume that a man named Dubeck is selling your client Black Acre. Okay. You look in the grantee index under Dubeck's name from the present time backwards until you right until you find a deed from Dubeck to Cotter in seventy seven. Okay. So Waji, what does that mean when you see a deed from Dubeck to Cotter? Or actually, from Cotter to Dubeck. In 77, what does that tell you? Okay. So you, again, you're buying it from a guy named Dubeck, and we learned that Dubeck bought it from Cotter in 77. By the way, that doesn't mean that's necessarily what happened. That's one side of the story. Right? For all we know, Dubeck could have recorded a fraudulent deed, which is why you have to be very careful with this. Right? You need to see not only what did Dubeck file, but what did Cotter file. But Cotter filed it in the other book. Uh -huh. So just hang with me, right? I know this is complicated. So we know at least according to Dubeck, he got it from Cotter in 77. Okay, the next one. Now you want to know how Cotter received the title. So you look again, and you flip backwards to 1952. And by the way, what does this mean? You have to look at every single line of every single book from 1977 to 1952. We're talking 25 years. Mm -hmm. And each year has multiple books, thousands of pages you're looking for. And you're searching for the word Cotter over and over. Cotter, no. Cotter, no. You can search through a thousand pages, not see the word Cotter. I'll oh, keep going. Eventually, you get to 1952. What was that? I said you should just PDF everything. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's not. It's complicated, but it, they're, they're digitizing records, but it's not automatic. Also, I don't think the title people would like that. That cuts away their business. Mm -hmm. No, it, protectionism is a very important reason why people don't innovate. It, it works. Oh, I gave an opinion. I'm sorry. Uh, I try not to. All right, so eventually you get back to 52, and you see Cotter got it from Barker. Matt, what does that tell you, obviously? Yeah, that at least according to Cotter, he got it from Barker in 52. Okay, everyone with me? Okay, designate, you're up next. Okay, so it says, now you want to know how Barker received title. So you're in Barker's name, the grantee index from 1952, backwards in time to the source of his title. Okay, you keep going, blah, 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 blah. And then you go back to 1900. That's not far enough, but for this question, we'll just presume it is. And you see that the owner in 1900 is Oliver. By the way, Oliver O means original. Just... I know it's obvious, but whenever you see O, that means the original. You'll see this all the time in questions. Okay, so now, a designate, after you get to Oliver O in 1900, what do you do at that point? What's your next step? Yes, exactly right. Why? And what do you want to find out next? Exactly. After you get back to the root, or what you call patent, right? The, the, you know, the OG, basically, right? The original grantor, if you will. You're welcome. Wow. Um, I'm, <laughs> see, see what I did there, right? After you get back to the original grantor, <laughs> the OG, right? Uh, you want to see who he sold it to. 
So you switch books. You go to the Grand Tour Index. Right? You go to the Grand Tour Index, and you go forward. So you look forward. You start with Oliver in the year 1900. You look for Oliver in 1901, 1902, 1903, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you find a deed from Oliver to Anderson. Shocking A, right? Anderson. In 1915. Okay. So at that point, you stop searching for Oliver's name, and now you look for Anderson's name. You look for Anderson in 1916, 1917, 1918. And eventually, in 1934, you find a deed from Anderson to Barker. But it's not recorded until 39. Okay, that creates a problem, right? Everyone see that's going on, right? In 34, Anderson sold a black acre to Barker, but it wasn't recorded until five years later. This is common. This happens all the time. So uh, 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 a blessing. Um, between 34 and 39, did Barker own black acre and fee simple? Yes. Why do you say yes? Because, um, the not yes, this was, this was Angie's question earlier. It's optional, right? It's optional. Between Anderson and Barker, that's a perfectly valid transaction. Barker owned it in fee simple. Everyone see me, right? But Celeste, let me ask you a follow-up question. What happens if Anderson was a crook? And let's say 1935, Anderson tries to sell you Blackacre, and you do your homework, right? And you do a title search. Will this transaction come up, the Anderson to Barker transaction? So if you bought Black Acre in 35, would you think you owned it free and clear? So that's the problem, right? By failing to timely record, Anderson come along and sell it to someone else. And then you have the issue with the recording statutes, right? Who prevails, Anderson, I'm sorry, Barker or, or Celeste in this case, right? We'll get to that question in a minute, but just be aware the reason why these recording statutes are important is because of situations like this, where there's a gap. There's a gap between when the deed is signed and when it's recorded. In this case, the gap is five years. It can be 30 years, right? You have, we'll have cases where there's a 30-year gap before recordation. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no, like, there's no limitation period for recording, but if you don't do it quickly, you create issues. You would. You would. To be super careful, you'd probably search Anderson all the way up and down and search Oliver all the way up and down. Because what if Oliver sold it to five different people in 15, 16, and 17, and 18, 19, 20? So the really good title searches, I know this sounds insane, they'll search every name all the way up and down and variant of the same spelling of the name. Right? Elliot with two T's with one L. They'll search every variant because they're not fooling around. They'll do every single possibility. Yes, AJ. No, no, no. That, that's just in textbooks. Whenever they want to use the, the original owner, they, just, they, they use the initial O. And so Oscar, right? Oliver, it's always an O. Just every property book I've ever seen always uses O. And I was like, why is it always O? Oh, because it's the original. That, that, that's the answer. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the topic of the second case, right? But, but even though there might not be a duty to search a variant, um, smart title companies will search for every single alternate spelling. Right? If it's William, they'll search for Bill. Right? They'll search for all different ways of, of, of writing out the name. And by the way, this is just Barker, right? Their first names also, my friends, right? <laughs> right? William Barker and Bill Barker might be the same people, but they might not be the same people. Right? Bob Barker, no, Bob Barker, right? <laughs> Bob, <laughs> Bob Barker and Robert Barker might be the same person. They might not be. I saw another hand. So, yes, uh, Michael. Uh, how would you get on this list if you obtained it through adverse possession? Oh, what a good uh, a question. So do you remember, do you remember Mr. Robinson from the first day of class, right? Do you remember what he did to sort of cement his claim? He the well, he won the news. Yeah, but what, what did he record? Bingo. Say it again. He recorded an affidavit of adverse possession. He put the public on notice that I, Mr. Robinson, was it Eugene Robinson? Yeah, my, Mr. Robinson, whatever his name was, right? Record this. Now, the better question is, <clears throat> how would anyone know to look for Mr. Robinson's name, right? So I, I can't find the document he filed, but I suspect he included the bank's name, just so, but you know, I don't even know. 
Maybe he included the name of the person he was squatting on. I'm not even sure what he did. I've, I've never found a piece of the actual. I could probably go dig it up in the records office. That'd be a useful thing to do. But he records some information to put people on notice. If anyone wants to do a field trip, the, I think it was in Flower Mound. You're welcome to do it. Yeah, I was in Dallas yesterday, but it wasn't close enough. OK. But everyone get the general gist, right? OK, so everyone get the A to B deed. It was recorded five years later. Okay, But eventually, when you get to 39, you then start searching for Bob, not Bob. You start searching for you know, Barker. The, pri the price is right. The day students want to know who Bob Barker is. I know Drew Carey. It's true. It's true. Spay your pets, right? Drew Carey does the prices right now. I know. It's weird. No, I don't. Is he alive? All right. All right. Uh, come on down, guys. Let's go. All right. All right. Then you go to 52. And you see the deed from <laughs> Barker to Cotter. Welcome back. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> see, uh, they will not get that one. Yeah. Uh, we're just, we're just. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a case in property called Boomer. And last time I was like, okay, Boomer, right? Uh, you'll, you'll get there. Oh, you did, maybe you did it in Torts, but the Boomer case? It's a nuisance case. All right, not important. All right. All right, so then you see there's a deed from Barker to Cotter in 52. Then you see from Cotter to Dubeck in 77, and then Dubeck to the present. All right. If that confused you, go back after class and just read those paragraphs again. But this builds what's called the chain of title, right? The chain of title. This is basically year by year who owns Blackacre. So I'll give you a summary. From 1900 to 1915, Oliver owns Blackacre and then sells it to Anderson. And then from 1915 to 1934, Anderson owned it, but he conveyed it to Barker. Anderson didn't actually own it from 34 to 39, but he was the record owner from 34 to 39. That is, if anyone did a title search in 34 to 39, Anderson's name would have popped up. Yet. Barker owned it in fee simple. He could have conveyed it if he wanted to. And if he conveyed it during that five year period, it would have created serious headaches. All right, imagine if Barker sold in 35. Someone comes along and says, hey, I did a title search. You don't own this property. I'm not going to buy it from you. Right? Anderson owns it. Right? So you can see how I can mess with this on the exam. Right? The years, <clears throat> I think my exam last year was, uh, it was actually a leap year question, where one was February 28th, one was February 29th, and someone did a transaction that, that leap year day where it didn't line up, right? So just, just be very careful with the dates when you line them up, OK? So from, and from 34 to 52, Barker owns it and sold it to Cotter. And then 52 to 77, Cotter owns it and sold it to Dubeck. But they need to update these years because 77 was a very long time ago. Right, this is like the ninth edition of the book, and 77 was probably recent then. That was a very long time ago. <laughs> what? What's that? <laughs> no, but I mean, like, you know, because that means the same person held it for almost, you know. I know, you're making me feel physical. Oh, fine. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I can't remember anymore. <laughs> All right, can we move on? All right. Now, how far back do you turn? Well, there's this little anecdote on page 667, which I always like to read, and especially someone from Louisiana. Um, you know, how far back do you run? And I love this little anecdote, right? So the state of Louisiana, right, it was acquired in 1803 by the Louisiana Purchase. And then uh, France obtained it from Spain by conquest, and Spain obtained it by discovery by the journeys of Christopher Columbus. Um, Columbus was authorized by the Queen of Spain. The, Spain was uh, uh, the Queen of Spain has her authority from the Pope. The Pope is authorized by Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, God made Louisiana. Uh, they forgot the native people. They, they were in there somewhere in the chain, somewhere in, somewhere in the middle. Uh, but you know, this illustrates that eventually you have to go back to some end point. This one goes back to, I guess, God. OK. All right. What's that? It, exactly. In fact, I teach this excerpt when I teach Johnson because it's perfect for the Johnson case. It makes less sense here. It makes more sense in Johnson because it's acquisition by discovery and acquisition by conquest. So I actually mentioned this in the first day of property one. 
I think it makes much more sense there. That's why I do it briefly here. Okay, questions? All right, let's do the first case. Uh, I think we did everyone? Yeah? So Dave, are you next? No. Oh, Tom, I thought I finished the route. Okay, so Tom, then I guess Davis on deck, okay? Uh, Tom, you want to give me the facts in um, uh, the Kansas case, Luthi versus Evans? Yeah. Okay. Um, what she did is she ended up selling them to this international group. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, as time went on, uh, she ended up, uh, when she recorded the deed, it was like a very generic deed. Okay. Right? Yep. Okay. And so basically, essentially, uh, that's the, the issue that they have right now is who actually owned the Kupal deed. OK, very good. All right. So we have a situation here, right? Miss Owens sells some interest in her mineral rights to, to this company, Tours. And the, 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 the document they use uses very broad language. It says that I convey all interests owned in the county, whether or not enumerated above. Okay? I convey all the interests I have, whether or not they're listed above. Davis, what's problematic about that sort of language? It's general and not specific. For sure. But as between Miss Grace Owens and Taurus, was that a valid deed? It's actually not the question. The, the, the question is what about the conflict, right? Oh, so With the third party. The, uh, what? The answer would be yes. Right. As between Miss Evans, right, and Tours, you can have that sort of conveyance, right? If I want to tell you I'm giving you all my property in the county, you can, you can take that deal. But, but, but Davis, what's the risk? in taking that sort of vague, open-ended transaction? Uh, the, the, when a third party enters the fray, do they have notice to? Yes, exactly. There's nothing wrong with this transaction, right? If you want to be a, an idiot, right, and pay for an unenforceable deed, you can do that, right? You can say, aha, I own all of Miss, uh, Miss, Miss Gracie's properties in the county, right? That sounds awesome. But when a third party comes in, in this case it was a burst, right? When Owen says, aha, I'm selling this property again to Mr. Burris, she, she too timed you. She cheated you. Right? Now, uh, uh, Jessica, if you're Burris, mm -hmm. right, if you're Burris, is there any way for you to know that Evans had previously conveyed the Kufel reserve? I uh, know, because it, I mean, there was no, it wasn't specifically recorded as the Kufel. Exactly. The difficulty with these clauses, which are known as Mother Hubbard clauses, is they do not put the parties on notice. Right? These Mother Hubbard clauses do not put the parties on notice about what has been conveyed. Now, why they're called Mother Hubbard? Remember the nursery rhyme, Old Mother Hubbard? Yeah, it was, what was it? Old Mother, I should actually learn, should learn these. I need to know them soon. Old Mother Hubbard, something, uh, Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to give the poor dog a bone. When she came there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog had none. It's basically this fairy tale of this old woman who has a cover with like nothing in there, right? So the idea is you have these clauses. And these clauses make sense. So for example, you have a deathbed confession, right? Imagine a person's on their deathbed and they've never had time to execute a will. They don't have time to like, oh, my bank account is this number and I want this and they just say, you know what? Everything to my wife, right? They're common in those regards. And they're effective in those regards, right? You don't have to list everything specifically. But here, the Mother Hubbard clauses fail to put on notice subsequent buyers, right? Burris was a subsequent buyer, and the Mother Hubbard clause do not put them on notice, right? Therefore, the court refuses to enforce the Mother Hubbard clause, right? 
as the third party, and that's the important point, right? This does not give notice to the third party, right? It does not give them notice. What's called constructive notice, which is the term you often hear. Yes, Jessica. This probably sounds so dumb, but the notice part really confuses me because how could there be notice of, to somebody who doesn't know these parties if, it won't, if it's not reported? I mean, I know we'll talk to it later. We'll talk about it later with different types of. Well, this case, for example, let's say you're Burris, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to search and you want to buy the property from Ms. Evans, right? Mm -hmm. What name are you going to search for? Right, right, right. But will there be any record that, that Evan sold it to Taurus? That's the key, right? You know the name of the person you're buying it from, and that's the only name you need to know. So is that, so, oh, okay. But the notice part would, uh, would only occur if it were recorded, correct? I mean, this case right. If there was a deed from um, Evans to Taurus, then you would search for Evans, you'd be on notice to search for Taurus okay. also, right? The key point is there was no way that Burris could have known Evans sold this to anyone. Right, because there was no deed right. that lists this property. Right, even if this deed was recorded, it wouldn't list Kufel. Okay. Right, so there's no way of knowing this transaction occurred. Okay. Is it the person, um, I mean, I don't understand why they couldn't, like the person who is, if it were a subsequent buyer, can't they change? The, I mean, can they change the description? Or? What do you mean? Like, I mean. You're, you're, you're buying it from Evans, right? Is there any indication Evan sold Kufel to Taurus? Is there any record anywhere that says that? I mean, if, if it's enough for one person to have gained to the property, can't they later go back? And well, let me, let me give you an answer. I think I see where you're going with this. If you search for Evans, you'll find the old Mother Hubbard clause. Once you find this clause is recorded, you might think, wait a minute, something's up. Mm -hmm. So there might be something there that you could be suspicious about. But what the court's basically saying is as a matter of policy, right, they will not let the Mother Hubbard clauses constitute constructive notice. Because that would require searching every conceivable property that Evans owns in the county. And then you have to figure out what does Evans own. So you have to go through the entire book of every entry of Evans ever. Now that's what they do anyway. They do that anyway, right? But here the court's saying we don't want to put this burden on the buyer, the subsequent buyer that the conveyance from <coughs> Owens to Taurus was not enough to give constructive notice. It doesn't describe with sufficient detail. Okay? Therefore, um, uh, uh, Burris did not have notice, <coughs> and he prevails. And you, know, you might say, this is not fair. Well, Taurus didn't have to do the Mother Hubbard Clause. They could have gotten a more precise deed and listed them all out. They did this probably for some, I think they're also trying to cheat her, right? It's like everything you have, oh yeah, we'll get everything, right? So maybe she had something, didn't even know about it, we'll get that also. So I think they tried to play a little fast and loose, they got burned, right? If you're doing oil and gas or mineral work, you want precision, you don't want these op open-ended things that can burn you later. See, I think, I, I read these cases every year, but I think Tours was trying to cheat Evans and she turned around and cheated them back, right? I, I think they two timed each other and then she got the last laugh because she's fine. That's what I think, I don't know. Maybe not, I, I'm not sure. Okay, oh uh, yes, blessing. So with the I mean, different types of deeds, you can all special and quick claim. Yes. So, uh, I mean, if uh, the person has been dating you, right, well, well, again, if, 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 um, a general, if Ms. Evans sold a general warranty deed, um, then Taurus could have sold her for, I'm sorry, Taurus could have sued her for, for, for breach of the Quiet Enjoyment Covenant. I think so. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall, did the, did the book say what kind of deed it was? I'm guessing it was quick claim, right? Specifically because it's everything. There's no way she can give a general warranty deed for everything. Just you can't write that kind of deed. So I'm guessing it was a quick claim deed. They thought they were getting out of the cheap and she scammed them in return. Right, I think they both are trying to scam each other and, and, they got, and the Taurus company got burned last. I don't know. See, these things are really dangerous. It, you don't realize this is, I almost trip backwards. There's, there's a lot of presence you have to have to do this class. Okay. All right, questions on the first case? Um, this is not the rule everywhere. In fact, Texas has a building. Indeed, Texas, yes, in Texas, 
the Mother Hubbard clauses are sufficient to give constructive notice. The case it's referenced is uh, Texas Consolidated Oils versus Bartels, B-A-R-T-E-L-S from 1954. So at least in this state, the Mother Hubbard clause uh, is sufficient. And this one was even broader. It, it referred to all the oil and gas leases anywhere within the United States, within the states of New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. It's even broader than the county. So some courts will enforce these Mother Hubbard clauses. Is that a hand, Leslie? Okay. All right. Questions in that case? Um, now, people often ask, Josh, what happens if, you know, the, the person working for the government screws up the book, right? Right? The person working for the government writes the wrong name. Can you sue them? No, because of governmental immunity. You generally can't sue employees for mere negligence. Uh, you, you can't. Um, so even if you do everything perfectly, if the government office screws up and maybe writes the wrong thing or maybe types the wrong thing now, or maybe it sits in their desk for a week and they don't record it right away, and in that one week span someone buys the property, you can't put you on the government. You can't. Too bad. Uh, okay, we'll go on to the second case. Anything else in the first case? All righty. Uh, I think, Chris, you're next. All right, you want to give me the facts in uh, the second case, or versus buyers? In this case, William Elliott had a judgment against him by or. Judgment was entered to the courts as a William Dwayne Elliott and William Dwayne Elliott, but the Elliott spelled differently. When Elliott went to sell some land, a check was done and the lien was not found. Mm -hmm. the proceeds from the sale were not used to satisfy the debt or then filed against Elliott and the people involved in the sale to satisfy the debt. Okay, very good. So um, the facts here are a little bit complicated, but I'll try to simplify them, right? If I owe you a debt, right, and I don't have any money, right, you say, okay, Josh, I'm going to put a lien on the one thing that you have of value, which is your home. And if you ever try to sell your home, I get a cut of that, right, $50,000. So whatever the purchase price of the house is, I get $50,000 off that, right? We don't have to foreclose on you, but I put a lien, right? Now, how do you notify people that this lien exists? You record it. So if I do a, a, you know, a title search for Josh Blackman, I'll see, aha, there's a $50,000 lien on it. And you have to know that once you buy the house, that's your problem, right? It would be wonderful if Josh took $50,000 from his proceeds to pay off the, pay off the what do you call it, the, uh, the debtor. That may not happen. And if I don't do it, they, they come after you. And that's what happened here. Um, or got a judgment against LA $50,000. OK, and let me just write out these names because people always get them confused. Okay, the name is spelled two L's and two T's, right? Elliot with two L's and two T's. But the judgment was spelled two L's and one T. Elliot with one, one T. Okay? But then when it was recorded, they recorded in two ways. Two L's and one T and one L and one T. So neither was correct, right? So they, they screwed up just royally, right? And by the way, this is a law firm doing this. It's not like some sort of government error. Um, this is malpractice, right? Everyone agree with me on this one? You got your client a victory and then you put the wrong damn name on the paper. Twice, you misspell it twice, right? You could have gotten one, you know, one right the other one. They misspell it right twice. So then Elliot sold the property to the buyers. Their name was actually, the, the buyers were actually the buyers. This is fortuitous, right? Elliot sold it to the buyers. And their title search didn't show up because they didn't search for Elliot with one L and whatever. They searched it for the correct spelling. Okay? And the buyers then obtained a loan from the bank. Okay? So now it gets kind of funky. Or sued the buyers seeking foreclosure of his lien, right? Then Orr argued that the defendants had constructive notice 
They should have known to search for the other different spellings. Now, I want you just to get this point. Who is actually litigating this case? It, it wasn't, oops, say it. The lawyer. The lawyer. It wasn't really Orr. Orr was not in this case. Okay, what happened was the law firm was litigating this case on its own, seeking the $50,000. Why? So just wanted to raise your hand. Yeah. They were in deep trouble. So here's what actually happened here. The law firm said, um, please don't sue us for malpractice. We screwed up. We'll give you the $50,000 cash now and just let us sue on your behalf so we can collect. Everyone understand what that means, right? The law firm said, okay, we screwed up. Please don't sue us for malpractice. It'll really hurt us, right? We don't want to get sanctioned by the bar. You can get sanctioned for this sort of stuff, right? So we'll just give them $50,000 cash to our own pockets and let us sue against the buyers to try to recover that so they can make themselves whole. Everyone just get what's going on? So Orr got his money no matter what. He was, he was, he was a cap. He, he didn't care. But the firm only get paid if they win, basically, contingency, right? Um, this is not a joke. You know, uh, when you're an attorney, you know, God willing, in a couple of years, right? Um, don't screw up things like this, right? If you put the wrong name on a form, it's as if your client didn't win, right? If you file something a day late, you lose a case and that, that's it, right? I know this sounds like little petty things, like, you know, when, when people fill out my eva the evaluation sheets and they don't fill the bubbles in all the way, I'm like, oh, come on, right? But that's sort of stuff that you get burned for, right? Little details matter, right? Like just putting the wrong T versus L, whatever, right? That can burn your case and you get in trouble. The bar can take discipline. Had Mr. Orr wanted to, maybe he did, he could file the bar complaint. You have no defense, you screwed up, right? You'd be you get public reprimand. You a uh, public reprimand goes in your record. Uh, not in Texas, but I think in California, any public rec reprimands are actually on your, uh, on your bar page. You can actually look up an attorney and see if there are any public uh, uh, actions taken against them. I don't think Texas has that. Does it? Arizona does. Some states do. Virginia, sh I Virginia didn't, yeah. Uh, I think that's a very, I don't think you can do that. I, I mean, maybe they had some sort of written settlement, but I don't. I don't think you can do that. Uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, 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 and then I think, I think it's like, please don't do, maybe they give them more than 50. I don't, I don't think you can waive that. Generally, you can't waive your rights. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think you can do that, and that's not my area. But I, I my 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 tentative reactions. You can't do that. And basically, let me give you some money, and please don't don't come at you know. You say you know. I, I hope this wraps things up. And like yeah, thanks for the cash. Screw you, bar complaint. <laughs> and that that that's it. In fact, I think to be frank, asking to waive it would itself be, I think, a sanctionable offense. I think asking them to waive their rights would itself be grounds for additional malpractice. I think, you know, stop digging, as they say. Right, you're in a hole, just, 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 just stop, stop digging your hole. I think, I, I, I think you're right. I don't think you can do that. Yeah, I don't think you can do that. Uh, okay, all right. Now, let's talk about this item sonans. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. I, I don't, Latin is not my strength. Um, Colleen, what is this item sonans doctrine? It's that though a person's name has been inaccurately written, the identity of such person may be presumed from the similarity of sounds between the correct pronunciation and the pronunciation of written. Okay, so practically speaking, Colleen, what would item sonans mean in this, in this case? What would that have me meant? Ooh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no switches were Josh Lean's other classroom suggestion, right? <laughs> it means it sounds the same, it is the same name. Right, okay, so the item Sonan's doctrine means you have a duty as the buyer to search not only for the actual spelling you have, but all similar, uh, similar spelling, spellings that are, that are kind of in the ballpark. Um, and, and not just for similar spellings, uh, nicknames also, right? Bill and William, Robert and Rob, right? Margaret and Peggy. Right? There are lots of different different ways of conveying a name. Yes, Anna. Is this why you do the I am one in the same statements? Like when, I don't know if you did. Like when we bought our 
my house, I've always had to do I am one and the same thing. Oh, that you've never held other names? Yeah. Like, like a maiden name or something? Yeah, I have a maiden name. I have a yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's, that, thank you, Anna. Yeah. <laughs> If you've ever held other names, you have to list those on your application for, for, for the mortgage so they can search for all variant names. But even then, it's common misspellings, right? Uh, 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 you know, Ginsburg, you are, by the way, Justice Ginsburg, it's URG. People spell it ERG all the time, even smart people, right? It's URG, right? Right, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, 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 Allen Ginsburg, exactly. Um, uh, but, but commonly misspelled names. URG versus ERG. Um, the item Sonen's doctrine would require the seller. Now, Corbett, does the court adopt this argument about the item Sonen's? No. They do not. Why not? Yeah, I, I, and I think that's the primary reason. Uh, the item Sonen's doctrine would put a significant burden on the buyer. It would require them to search not just for the one name, but five different variants of the same spelling. That creates a lot of work. And once you go down the road of saying, oh, well, you know, this is close enough, you know, you create a lot of additional uh, uh, work. Okay, so they reject the item Sonin's doctrine. Now, as a practical matter, I can tell you the title search people do this anyway, right? They're not stupid, right? They know that these sorts of mistakes happen. Elliot, 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 right? Or, you know, my name Blackman. There was a Justice Harry Blackman, M U N. People misspell my name all the time. They know the justice. In fact, I've been cited in court decisions as Blackman, M-U-N. I've gotten it fixed, which is fortunate. I had to make a call. But uh, it, it sucks. It's like, that's not my name, right? So smart title companies know to just search for all variants anyway. They, they, don't, they don't even mess around with this stuff. It's, there's too much money at stake. Uh, but the court won't impose that duty affirmatively on the buyers. OK. Everyone get the? Case. This probably won't come up again, but you may have some sort of exam question where things are misspelled. It just pay attention. On the exam, I won't say the names are spelled differently. I'll just give the names and say, oh crap, they're not spelled the same, right? It won't be obvious. You'll have to look carefully at the names. So just, just pay attention if the names are spelled similar and just don't read them quickly because that's an easy way for me to test you if you are paying attention. It's a little, little details matter. It's true. What was that? Oh man, yeah, that'd be bad. Uh, I check them very carefully. If I do, then I'm sorry, but I, I try really hard not to have any errors. Uh, my first year teaching, I was so mad. I had a mistake in the exam. It was so obvious what I meant, right? Uh, and the students just flipped out. And it, it, it didn't even impact the outcome of the score because the score would have been the same otherwise, but I had one typo. People just got all livided. So I'm, I've not had one once since, I think. I've been very careful, but it was my first year teaching, and I was so mad at myself. But I, I read them very carefully. And someone says, Can I, do you want me to proofread it? No. No, no one proofreads my exams. That's, that's not an option. I, I get people, but not, not you. OK, that would be really dumb. One year, um, I, <laughs> I wrote a, a sample. I, I wrote a midterm for my students. And I had my research, my Langdell proofread it. And you know what he did? He actually handed it out the Langdell session to go over. I was so, I, I mean, I, I, I was so mad. I couldn't yell at him. I was so mad. I had spent so much time writing it. And I'm glad he told me, because if he hadn't told me, I gave that as a thing, it would have been really bad. So now no one sees it. Just, it's, it stays in my house. No one else that's how my house sees it. OK. I was so mad. I was, I was pissed, because <laughs> I spent a lot of time writing that question. And only like 10 students went to Langdell, so everyone had it. So a, a small sliver of the students had it, which made it even worse. So I just threw out the question and wrote a new one. All right. Let's move on. Uh, recording acts. Now, let me explain at a high level what these recording acts are. We always have conflicts where Black Acre is sold to multiple people, right? Black Acre is sold to A, and Black Acre is sold to B. The recording statutes, the recording acts, resolve who wins, A or B, right? The purpose of recording statutes is to resolve which of two subsequent buyers wins, right? Either A or B, or C, D, and E, right? I can do this with five people. But you see which of subsequent buyers own it. OK. The, uh, if you go to page 682, please. I think it's at the bottom. OK. Uh, OK, so it actually. 
OK. So the first type of recording act is the one you'll never see, but it's the easiest one to explain. It's what's called a race statute, R-A-C-E. And this is literally a race to the courthouse. You've heard that expression, race to the courthouse? That's what a race to the courthouse is. When you have a conflict between subsequent buyers, whoever records first wins. Right? When you have two people, both by black acre, whoever records first prevails. Take a look at on 683, the next page, uh, example number two. Okay, it says owner of black acre conveys to A, who does not record. Okay? Then O sells to B for consideration. Okay? B actually knows the deed to A. Right? B is aware that A bought it, and B is aware that A never recorded, and B buys it anyway. He's a crook. Right? O is a crook. B is a crook. The only honest guy here is A. B was lazy, didn't record. Who wins? In this case, B records first. B wins over A. This is the easiest one and the most brutal one. It records whoever, re uh, sorry, it rewards whoever records first, even if they knew, even if they had notice about the prior transaction. Okay? This is the easiest one to apply. It's a bright line rule. Right? You record first, you win. It doesn't matter what you knew. Everyone loves this one. Oh, God, the Josh is so easy, right? Uh, it exists in two states, our friends in Louisiana and then in North Carolina. Uh, some of you are laughing. Right. Uh, it, it doesn't exist anywhere else. You won't see it anywhere else. Okay, any questions on the notice? I'm sorry, the race statute. All right, the second one is far more common, and this is the one, in fact, that we have here in Texas. It's what's called a notice statute or a notice recording statute. You'll see it, you know, refer to different ways, but the word's notice. The notice statute doesn't focus on who records first. It focuses on notice, right? That is, did a subsequent purchaser have notice of a prior transaction, all right? I can explain it to you in words, but it's easier for you to actually read the examples. Let me read it to you. O, owner of Blackacre, conveys Blackacre to A, who does not record. It always starts that way. If A records right away, the, the question's over. Right, because if A is the first to buy it, and A records immediately, we're done, because everyone's on notice. So this only, this, this crap only happens because A doesn't record. So I promise you at least that much. On an exam question, A's not going to record, because that that, that's going to end the question right there for you. Okay. A fails to record. O then conveys Blackacre to B for consideration. B has no knowledge of A's deed. Right, he has no knowledge. B wins over A, even though B does not record. Let me explain that again. Even though B fails to record, B still prevails over A. Precisely because he took it without notice. With a notice statute, recording doesn't really matter. It doesn't play a role. It matters if the subsequent buyer acquired it without notice. I'm getting there next. That's my next point. Right? So the next question I think Angie was hinting at, which I'm going to get to right now. What if A records after B buys, okay, but before B records? Okay, if A records first, B loses, okay? Right, this only works in the rare case where both A and B don't record this example. Okay? All right. 
So there's some downsides to the notice statute. Right? What is the downside? It requires looking at facts, not in evidence. Right? It requires looking at facts, not in the record. What do I mean by that? It's really tough to determine who has actual notice. Because people can play dumb. They, oh, I didn't know. Right? And it's not constructive notice, it's actual notice. So often, the subsequent buyer will never fess up and admit he knew. So you have to prove it using extrinsic evidence, which is always risky. OK? On the plus side, there's fairness. Right? If B acquired second and had no knowledge about A, he can still win. Everyone with me? All right. I'll show you the Texas recording statute, section 12.003. Where is it? Uh, it's long. Uh, OK, so OK, here we go. OK. Basically, it says, OK, here it is. In order for a title to be granted, the subsequent buyer could not have had actual notice. I'm summarizing the, the entire thing, but that's basically what it says. Right? You need to have actual notice. If you have actual notice, you can't claim the benefit of the statute. If you lacked actual notice, then you can be protected by the recording statute, and you can win even if you don't record first. Yes, AJ? Would the exam have a mix of these statutes, or would it be? So let me answer this question like this. I'll tell you on the exam which jurisdiction you're in. It's going to be one of the three. It'll be race, notice, or race notice. Right? I can also be tricky and say you're in Texas, and you'll need to know which recording statute applies in Texas. Or you're in North Carolina. Or I can say you're in California. Right? And you'll have to know which, one, which state you're in. But I, there's no hybrid. right? There's no like a little of this, a little of that. Yeah, I, I can't make one up. That'd be a little bit too difficult for you. It, what's that? No, no, I don't think it'd be fair. So there are three, and I think there are, three is bad enough. Yes, Rebecca? Is race it is. That's the next one I'm getting to in a minute. So let's do the next one. Uh, the third one is the most complicated one, um, <coughs> which is called the race notice statute. And this is example number four. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll read you the rule, which is not clear, but I'll, and at least I'll read it to you. The subsequent, yes, Mike? There's race, notice, and race notice. Okay, gotcha. Number one is race, number two is notice, number three is race notice. And believe me, my friend, people confuse them all the time. They're hard enough to understand, People mess up the labels. So uh, to your question, AJ, just I, I can trick you different ways. I don't need to trick you by making up different things, right? It's hard enough to know the three. People get confused, OK? All right, the race notice is kind of like a mishmash of the first two, which is why, of course, California uses it. California has the most complex rules for everything. Uh, it's usually the case. Under the race notice statute, a subsequent purchaser is protected against a prior unrecorded instrument only if two conditions are true. Okay? The subsequent purchase is protected against a prior unrecorded instrument if two conditions are true. The subsequent buyer did not have notice. And second, the subsequent buyer records first. In other words, you need to not only have notice, <coughs> You also need to record first. Let me say it without the negatives. To win, you cannot have notice, and you have to record first. I know there's negatives in there. It gets, it gets complicated. Read example, uh, example number four on, in your book. Let me read it out loud, please. O, owner of Blackacre, conveys Blackacre to A, who does not record the deed. Always that's the way it starts. O then conveys Blackacre to B, who does not know the deed. Okay. 
Stop right there. If you were in Texas, right, and we stopped right here, B prevails. Because in Texas, the only requirement is to have no notice. But in California, you keep going. Right? In California, we say, OK, A records, and B records second. Because B was not the first to record, A wins. A prevails because B was not the first to record. Let me state it simply. In California, to benefit, you have to have no notice and you have to record. If you only do one of those things, you lose. You got to do both of them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You need to have both. Yes, bless him. I, I think it's actual. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to have both. No yeah, Rebecca. doesn't matter yeah well it wouldn't matter no now let me flip this around what if B recorded first yeah if B records first B prevails so the deciding factor is you have to have no notice and you have to be the first to record if you have no notice and your second to record you're lost yes Rebecca Well, hold on. Race or race notice? Which race one? Notice. Say your question again, then. Okay. So I guess the reason is like the notice element on B's behalf, but what if there's notice on A's behalf? Well, A was the first one to sell, so it doesn't really matter for what he learns. It doesn't matter why he records. Okay. But whether or not he knows doesn't matter. Right. In fact, let me state it separate. Let me ask you this question, Rebecca. When A records first, is there any way for him to know about the B transaction? No. No. Because that hadn't recorded yet. So there's really, it, notice doesn't matter as to A. It only matters as to B. Okay. Yes, Corbett. So you said you don't have to record a B for it to be valid, but in this particular case, it could be good. No, no. What did I say? Between O and A. That's the key point, which I can't stress enough. Between O and A, you don't need to record. But the failure of A to record might burn him later with B, with a third party. That was the first thing I said at the beginning of class. It's valid between O and A, but third parties creates problems. And there will always be third parties. There are always third parties. No one has property forever. Yeah, you should. And usually the title company does all that stuff for you. You don't have to worry about it, but it's important. Okay. Let's go to problem number two on page 685. OK, so it says, O conveys Whitecker to A, who does not record. O subsequently conveys to B, who purchases in good faith and for valuable consideration does not record. This is always a setup, right? A doesn't record and B doesn't record. A then records and conveys to C. C purchases in good faith for consideration. OK? So let me just stop right there. I think who's next, Corbett or Holly? So Corbett, right over here, right? When A sells it to C, will C be on notice that something's up? No. Why not? Because it's not recorded. What's not recorded? The deed. The deed to B. Yes. There is no record of the O to B deed, right? As far as C knows, B is not in the picture. But Corbett, there's something else that might be up. What might C be suspicious about? Right, C is buying it from A. Why might C be suspicious here? What might you want to know if you're buying the property from A? And is there any record of where A got it from? No. no. So this is doubly dubious. Ooh, doubly dubious, right? This is problematic in two ways. So first off, there's no record of the O to B transaction, so they can't find it. Second, A has it. Where did A get it from? There's no record there. But C buys it anyway, takes a risk. 
right? Maybe he knows C, I'm sorry, maybe he knows A, trusts him. Okay. C purchases in good faith. Then B records. Then C records. Okay, B records. Then C records. Okay, so Holly, we have a dispute here. We'll first do the notice jurisdiction, right? So you see there's two questions. First is notice, second is race notice. So let's start with the notice. Let me ask you a question first. Who has a stronger claim here? A. It doesn't matter between, between B and A, it, I'm, I'm telling you you're a notice statute, right? Between B and A, who has a stronger claim here? A. Why do you say A? First. We're in a notice statute. Okay, what's a notice statute? Okay, so look up here. Between B and A, which was the subsequent buyer? Who, who bought last? B. Okay, did B have any notice of the A transaction? Yes. Is B a bona fide purchaser? Yes. So between B and A, who, pre uh, who prevails? B, that's right. Okay, keep going. So now, between C and B, right? Did C have any notice that B was in the picture? When C bought Blackacre from A, was there any way for C to know that B was in the picture? Why not? Okay, that's good. So, but, so is C a bona fide purchaser for value? Yeah, because we bought in good faith and for valuable consideration. Okay. So in a conflict between B and C, who prevails in a notice per a jurisdiction? C. That's right, right? Sucks to be, right? Here, C acquired without notice, and that's all you need, right? C wins here, right? C can't be expected to search for B, right? Even though B recorded, C can't be expected to search for B's name because there's no way to even know that B exists. Because he bought it from A. Yeah? Did you also look at like, because A recorded? A didn't record here though. That's an important point. Had A recorded, I think this, this case turns out differently. Because if A recorded, right? Uh, uh, okay, A, no, A recorded, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. So say your question again. I'm sorry. All right, so um, uh, what I was thinking was because A recorded first and then B recorded after A, would, would B like null and void because of that? No, you're in a notice statute, right? In a notice statute, what matters is taking without notice. Now let me do the next one, right? Let's do, I'm sorry. Let's do the race notice statute, right? In the race notice statute, you need two things. Have no notice and you have to record first. Right? Uh, Mac, I think you're next. Right? So with a race notice statute, who was the first to record in this case? Oh, no, as Mike reminded us a second ago, who actually was the first to record? OK. Right? A recorded before B. Right? That means A prevails over B. OK? Now, Mac, here comes a hard question. Who prevails, C or B? I was going to say B, but since A recorded before, and then they conveyed C. OK. The answer here is C. And let me explain why, OK? C prevails over B. Why? Because C did not record before B. In order for C to beat B, C would have to record before B. It's not enough for C to take without notice. In a race, in a race notice statute, C would have to go over here and record first. 
Mike, the difference between the notice statute and the race notice statute is with the notice statute, whoever records first doesn't matter. But with the race notice statute, you both have to have no notice and be first to record. Right? C prevails because B recorded first. No. Sorry, I'm confusing myself. C prevails because C recorded first. And in this case, he did not. Right, right. Had C recorded first, I'm going to hide the other one, right? Had C recorded first, he would prevail. But C. Oh, now I'm twisting myself, yeah. C. Yeah, I'll do it again. I'm sorry. You can see how these get real confusing. I'm so, I, I apologize, OK? When C acquired Blackacre, right, it was in good faith. And C did not have notice that B was in the picture. Are you with me? OK. So he had good faith, no notice. But B recorded first. And because B recorded first, C loses in California, right? Let me give that uh, the flip side. Had C recorded first, that is C purchased as good faith, bona fide, and then recorded right over here, C would have prevailed in California. But isn't B, okay, so A recorded that they got it from O. Yes. And then wouldn't B be recording that they also got it from O? Yes, and that's why if B records first, C loses. But if A has recorded and then conveys to C, then A has already said, no, O gave it to me, it's on record. So then how could B come in and say, oh no, O gave it to me too, it's mine. Let's, let's just get the, sequ let, let's get the sequencing straight, right? And this might go a minute or two past now, I hope you'll, you'll indulge me because I want to make sure you get this one right. Um, O conveys to A. A does not record right away. Okay, so the transaction O to A is not recorded. O then conveys to B, who purchases in good faith. At that point, B does not have any notice of the prior transaction. Okay? A records the transaction after B bought it. That's the important sequencing, right? When B purchased, B was bona fide. He had no knowledge of the prior transaction, right? In Texas, that's good enough to win. In California, it's not. In California, you need to be the bona fide and record first before the subsequent buyer. Say that one more time, right? In Texas, with a notice statute, it's efficient to be the subsequent buyer without notice. But in California, you have to have two things. The subsequent buyer and you record first. In this case, because C recorded before B, right? I'm sorry. Uh, B recorded before C. I'm sorry. This is not my best moment. B recorded before C, right? Right. He was on first. Exactly. <laughs> right. S Okay. What was that? No, let me let me do it one more time. I, I don't want I don't have these issues, okay? Okay. All right, let's try this one more time. All right. Start from the top. O conveys what acre to A. A doesn't record that one, right? O then conveys it to B, who purchases it in good faith and for consideration. He doesn't record it, right? Why? There's no way, there's no way for B to know about the O to A transaction, OK? In Texas, right, B's in good faith. He's fine, OK? But now you have another transaction, right? What's this other transaction? A to C. C purchases it in good faith and for consideration. C is also a bona fide purchaser. 
right? So in Texas, when you have two bona fide purchasers back to back, the subsequent one prevails between the two of them, right? So C would prevail in the notice statute. Okay? Everyone with me? Okay. So now let's try it in California. All right. In California, it works a little bit differently because you need two things. C would need to take without notice, and C would need to record first. Okay, everyone get that? All right. So here what happens is B acquires it first with good faith. Great. Then C acquires in good faith. Great. But for C to prevail, C would have to record first. Does that happen here? No. no. Who records first? B. Better you say it than me, right? B records first. And because B records first, C cannot claim the protection of the recording statute, and C loses. Did I get that one right? Yes, that was perfect. This is a hard one. Okay, all right. Just guys, just hang tight. Just I want to make sure everyone gets it. Yeah, Leslie and then Lacey. You know, I don't remember what I said last year. Let's talk after class, and I'll, I'll figure it out. But ah, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember what I said last year, but I will take it up. Is that a question also? <laughs> Say that again? You know what, I, I, ha, everyone's more or less packed up. Come up afterwards and ask me and we'll talk about it maybe a little bit later, okay? Okay, all right? All right.